So the heroes are all women, that's true, but there's no vision of feminine empowerment. Does everyone understand what that, I mean by that sentence? I mean, you've got women heroes, but they're not being feminine. They've just become men, right? But there's no integration. There's no new narrative of what it means to be the new woman. Who's the level three woman? So there's no level three woman and there's no level three man. The difference is, is that women still come out heroes. You get this? That in the movie, the women still are the heroes and the men are actually tragic and pathetic. Like, welcome, mad welcome, everyone. Now, let me just check in on a couple of things. So first off, I'm in the lobby of Bretton Woods. So if you just get a sense, can I, is it okay if I pick up the computer, everyone, just to give you a sense of location, just for complete delight. So here we go. Can you see it? And Krista, maybe talk to me and give me some feedback. Just tell me if you can see it. Yes, perfect. Beautiful. Okay. You get a sense of Bretton Woods. So Bretton Woods is, you know, I don't know, must be, you know, decades and decades old. And this is the place where the post-World War II order was established. The economic order, right? The political order. It's this massive, you know, gorgeous, you know, building from a different era, which you guys can feel. And I'm actually sitting in the lobby where you're not supposed to do a, a podcast or a one mountain. And people are kind of looking at me a little bit, but I think it kind of works. So here we go. You ready, everybody? Okay. So usually I get like five, 10 minutes before we start one mountain to actually just write down some thoughts. I just write down a couple of notes. It's been a very insane day. The last actually, actually 10 days have been day and night, number one. And number two, just this is probably too much information, but maybe I thought I would get some sympathy. I'm having this kind of shooting back pain moving up and down my spine right now. So that's just kind of happening. I was at Sally Kempton's. A lot of us were there together two weeks ago for the memorial. And I set up, I had a weight set there that I had at Sally's because I visited Sally for 15 years. And the weights were in the garage under a pile of things. So I kind of picked up these like 60 pound weights the wrong way. And my back didn't like the way exactly. My back did not like the way that happened. So I kind of pulled my back, which allowed me to experience the pain of Sally passing in my body, which was a great joy. I was very overjoyed of that, but I would also like to have that pass. So it hasn't, hasn't quite worked. So I, I was looking all over the lobby for a chair that I could manage to sit in long enough because sitting doesn't work too well. So if I get anything wrong here, right, or if I'm kind of go slow, so I couldn't quite concentrate just because of the, the pain level to actually write things out. And I just dropped my son off in Portland. And I, so I stopped by Bretton Woods on the way back to kind of find everyone and not miss us this week. Okay, so we're going to do a wild ride now. we are do a crazy wild ride. This is, I'm doing this the first time out loud. And we're going to step into culture in a, really a kind of shocking way. And I'm going to ask everyone to, you know, in the, in the chat box to share with us, but try not to go off in a different direction. Try and stay with us, right? If you have thoughts and comments, try and stay with us, but try and stay with, because I'm going to try, I'm going to, try and do so much that it's going to be hard to do the chat box at the same time. So here we go. Okay. We're going to start with Barbie and we're going to go to Oppenheimer. Fair? Okay. First, now I'm assuming lots of people have not seen Barbie, right? That's my assumption. So my guess is, has half of the people, who's seen Barbie? Has anybody seen Barbie? One, two, three, four, five, right? Okay, so that's okay. Barbie is, is one of the highest grossing movies, right, in the world now. It's in the top, I think, you know, 25 of all time. You know, it's gone, done a billion dollars. It's now about to move around the world. And it's a very fascinating movie, right, that I wanna really recommend that everyone see it. The reviews on Barbie, don't have the slightest clue what it's about. So this movie is entered culture and the Barbie doll, right, is in culture, right? Barbie is the doll, right, that women have grown up for generations around the world playing with. And the movie is a very subtle movie that gets it exactly half right and exactly half wrong. And so I want to ask everyone to take the time to see the movie afterwards, especially if you haven't seen it. This will, this will really open up a whole new way of both understanding the movie, but I don't, 
I mean, I don't really care about the movie, right? We don't, we don't have any obligation to understand Barbie in the world. We're interested in understanding the universal love story. We're interested in understanding Eros. We're interested in understanding what the new human and the new humanity is, okay? And I wanna just notice something together, okay? So everyone ready? Drum roll, here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna try and go through like, you know, 30, 40 points one at a time, but fast. So one, let's notice that the meta crisis is happening at the same time as the gender crisis. Isn't that interesting? So the meta crisis that's happening around the world is happening at the exact same time where we have this massive crisis of what does it mean to be a man or what is a man and what's a woman? And, and the complexity and confusion around that issue is enormous. So there's a, a gender crisis, but I would call it a gender identity crisis, right? A, one. Two is there's a crisis of sexuality. We don't have a sexual story. We don't have a sexual narrative. We don't have a crisis of desire. And three, there's an actual meta crisis of existential risk in which we risk the death of humanity or through various forms of what we call techno feudalism, we risk turning reality into a kind of Skinner's box. And a Skinner's box is a box in which rats and pigeons are controlled by the controllers of the box, even though they're unaware that they're being controlled, right? So there's two kinds of existential risk, and one is the death of humanity, really death to our existence, and the second is the death of our humanity. So there's death of humanity and the death of our humanity. We've talked about that many times. Everyone get what I mean by that? The death of humanity, actual extinction, and the death of our humanity. So, so just notice that there's no coincidence, there's no coincidence in the intimate universe. The fact that the gender crisis and the crisis of desire are happening at the exact same time as the meta crisis is significant. Now, both the movie Barbie and the movie Oppenheimer, right, speak directly into this. So one of the things that we do in One Mountain, we do many things in One Mountain together, but one of the things we've done, right, Ujis, over this year, is we sometimes look at the texts of public culture so we looked at Dune, D-U-N-E, the Dune movie. We looked at Avatar, we did a number of weeks. We've looked at Don't Look Up, right? We've looked at, right, we, we've done very deep dives. I did with my friend, Aubrey Marcus. We did, what did we do? We did Guardians of the Galaxy, right? And we actually did one on Lord of the Rings that hasn't played yet, okay? So reading the texts of culture is a very big deal. And the two major movies in North America that are on their way to Europe, right, this summer are Oppenheimer, Right, it's about Robert Oppenheimer, who was the father of the atomic bomb and who conceived the Los Alamos project, number one. Right? And number two, right, you have this Barbie movie, which, which kind of blows the box office. Both of them blow the box office away. So I want to actually show that these two movies are deeply related. And, and they're actually related to, to the, the deeper issue is always Eros. It's always the goddess. It's always she. It's always the field of desire. So let's start, okay? So I wanna, I'm gonna go slow here for a second. If maybe if somebody can volunteer to kind of write some points in the chat box, simply because we're just gonna take them one at a time. And each one is kind of significant and distinct. Okay, so one, I just wanna put a framework in place, okay? I'm gonna talk about three levels of relationship to our own feminine or masculine, to our own man or woman. And for now, I'm mean, gonna use the word man and woman synonymously with feminine and masculine. I'm obviously deeply aware of the fact that men are both feminine and masculine and women are both feminine and masculine, obviously. And there's a lot to say about that. And we're gonna do a huge, huge dive at the mystery school into the new human and the new gender and what that means. And we're gonna critique both gender ideology, the leveling of differences between men and women, and we're gonna critique kind of the old gender view. So we're gonna try and create actually for the first time a new view of gender. What's homo amor's view of gender? We're gonna do that at the mystery school. But for now, for now, I just wanna use masculine and feminine and man and woman together. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make the distinction. I'm just gonna make, to make it easy for our conversation. Fair, does that make sense, everyone? Terry, are you good there? You're good. Okay, Terry's good, I'm good. Okay, so let's see if we can do this. So here's our three levels. 
level one is the classical feminine, right? Who's, I would say level one, let's call it level one woman and level one man. So level one woman, I'm going to identify as the classical woman of, let's say the fifties in the United States, right? Or in Europe, pre-feminism, before feminism. And her job is to be somebody's wife and somebody's mother, right? Not enough to be somebody's daughter. You got to be somebody's wife or mother. You've got to take care of them, right? You have to look beautiful. You have got to look beautiful all the time, right? Because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to never lose your cool, right? And, you know, your job is to be, you know, the perfect woman. That's your job, right? And of course, you need to be recognized by a man. If you're not recognized by a man, it hasn't worked. And that's, that's the job of the feminine. She sees this kind of classic, and, and, and don't worry everyone, I'm not taking the time to give a full description, obviously, but this is kind of level one, right? The job of the feminine is to seduce the man, to get a husband in order to have a relationship, in order to have stability and security, in order to have children, right? In order to raise the next generation or whatever it might be, okay? So that's one. The man is, of course, the classical 1950s man. He's got to be a protector and a provider, right? And he's got to, you know, and he's the person in charge and it's kind of classical patriarchy, right? In, in all of those senses. And, and he needs to have a wife, clearly. And he clearly is, is moved by the feminine. But in the end, he's in charge. He's making the rules. Right, he's being the doctor and he's being the lawyer and he's winning the Nobel Prize and he's the politician and she's in a support role. Fair? That's fair. And how does sexuality work between them? Right? And other sexuality between them is he's in charge fundamentally. Right? We don't even have any laws against sexual harassment. They don't even exist. There's no sexual harassment law, it doesn't even exist. Right? I mean, it's so it's so actually dramatic, is that actually in many states. In the United States, in countries in Europe, marital rape, being raped by your husband, isn't even on the books. It's not even illegal, right? No one, right? That, di that didn't even exist. You're supposed to kind of submit to your man. No one had written anything about, you know, the G spot. My dear friend Robin, who joins us often in One Mountain, I don't think she's with us this week because her mother just passed, but her mom actually wrote the book, The G Spot. She just passed at 102. She was a student of Reichs. Right. And 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 Robin's actually been, you know, at Alice, her mother's house, who wrote the G spot, has been there all week and kind of gathering her material and putting together her life. So this is before we're at level one, this is before the G spot was written. It's before feminine orgasm, right? Actually had a place, right? You know, that was dominant in the modern world. Now, let me be clear, in the ancient world, it was much different. I'm talking about just the last hundred years. I'm not looking, I'm not talking about all of history. I'm talking about the classic vision of the last hundred years. Is that fair, everyone? Then you go to level two. Okay, now level two, as we're gonna see, is where the movie Barbie happens, okay? But level two is, let me just kind of create the structure. Level two is, it's not about, it's not about the man's in charge and the woman's support. It's actually, it's, a, it's egalitarian. The man has actually become more sensitive and more kind and he's reading a little roomy and he's more of a sensitive new age guy and he's a little, a little more in touch, just a little bit, you know, and the woman's got a job and she's, she's gotten into medical school and she's gotten into law school and she's, she's, you know, winning some Nobel prizes, right? And so there's, there's more of an equality between men and women and men and women are partners now. They're partners, that's, that's the ideal role, they're partners, right? But at this level two, at this level two, it gets a little complicated. Okay, and this is where Barbie's gonna start. And it gets complicated for a couple of reasons. One, sexuality starts to disappear. So I'm gonna tell you something very wild and funny, okay? And not so funny. So in most liberal households, classical liberal households around the world, marriages, there's almost no sex at all. That's just true. Okay, no one says it out loud, but anyone who's on the phone who recognizes this, you don't have to nod, don't say anything, just keep a poker face so no one will know, right? But basically not much sex happening, right? In marriages all over the liberal world, that's just true. Now, why? So it's for a bunch of reasons, 
One is there's no, there's no story of desire. There's no sexual narrative. That's not our topic today. But there's another reason, which is there's no polarity, right? In other words, there's this kind of equal partnership and everyone's working really hard at being equal, but actually there's no polarity and polarity means there's not the, the play of magnets. Right when you have these two roles, and he's the you know he's the provider, and you know she's the breadwinner, and there's this polar balance between them, and there's kind of attraction, and there's allurement, and then there's also autonomy, and and when you have these defined roles, and you have these very different roles, there's what's called polarity. My friend John Gray, back in 1990, wrote a lot about polarity, not in his Venus Mars book, in a different book. He wrote a, wrote several very good chapters on polarity. And in the, the modern egalitarian couple, they're both working, right? Or, or track this, or only she's working. Now stay with this for a second, my friends, right? Because this is also going to be key to the movie Barbie. A, a, and a very, very important book written in 2011, which conquered the American markets, is called The Rise of Women and the End of Men. The Rise of Women by the End of Men written by a, a woman, classical, you know, Israeli woman actually, but classical Western liberal. She writes for Slate. And it's basically about men not having a job, manufacturing jobs ending around the world, women becoming more and more of the people who are the primary breadwinner, right? About to cross the 50% line where most homes have actually a woman as a primary breadwinner, not a man. Wow. Right? The woman actually doesn't have to be a homemaker, right? Contraception has split between children and sexuality. So women are actually working, they're getting jobs, they're employed. And women began to ask the question, which is, why do we need a man? Right? Right? I can have sex when I want to, if I want to. And I don't need a man in order to survive, right? In order to make a living right? The communication is not so good between us anyways, because they never understand what I'm talking about. So why do I need a man? And that becomes this big question, right? It's no longer the polarity is gone. The protector homemaker is gone. You've got this either equal relationship, or you have the woman as the primary breadwinner. That's true in, again, more than 50% of homes at this point. So where's the polarity? How does the polarity happen? It's got to happen in a new way. Something new has to happen. But what happens is, right, unless that something new happens, unless there's a new relationship, unless there's a new quality of relationship, actually the polarity disappears. And with the polarity, what else disappears? Sexuality. Isn't that amazing? In other words, and it's a combination of several things. First, sexuality is available outside of the home. So lots of people find ways to have sexuality outside of the home. Two, there's pornography, which actually changes the game. Instantly available pornography actually changes reality, not just on the male side, but on the female side, right? Number two, right? Number three, which is a very big deal, the, the, the sense of the desire, right, to be sexing kind of disappears because sexing was part of this larger relationship, this larger polarity, there's larger wholeness. But now as men now don't have jobs, and you have this huge class of men, right, all over the Western world who have lost manufacturing jobs, right, and, and actually are not in the, the small 5% of the elite of lawyers and accountants and bankers and doctors, but the overwhelming majority of men are not in that category. They're not actually being primary breadwinners. And women are saying, I'm not attracted. So just like men have often been attracted to the body of the woman, Women have often been attracted to the body of the car. And by the body of the car, I mean, right, the capacity of the man to be a protector. And if he's not a protector, and he's not a breadwinner. Actually, for many women, women objectify men, just like men objectify women, right? Works on both sides. And so when you don't have, right, the, the male protector, a lot of the objectification and the attraction actually disappears. So that's this level two. We have this level two in which it's not actually feminist and cool to be a sexy woman in the same old way. You're not supposed to be seducing men. You're supposed to have an independent identity, independent of men, 
right? Why am I involved in this seducing men thing, right? And so I'm becoming this independent woman. And, and however, in the second stage, in this classical feminism, right? Becoming this new woman actually means becoming more like a man, right? Because I become more like a man. I've got a job, right? And, and I'm not doing the, the kind of hot sexual thing anymore. And I've got to hide my emotions because I'm supposed to be in the workplace. And why am I getting all emotional, right? And, and, and men, right? Who They don't know who they are because there's this huge millions and millions and millions and tens of millions of men all over the world who aren't the protector. They're not the people who are earning the money. So if unless I have a strong sense of identity from someplace else, who am I? Does everyone get that? Okay, that's our frame. And we haven't gotten to level three. Does everyone get that? We haven't gotten to level three. We're not at level three. And we're going to be talking about level three at the mystery school. We haven't gotten to level three. Now, with that in mind, it's going to get crazy for a second. So with that in mind, we're going to go to Barbie. Everyone ready? Here we go to Barbie. So Barbie opens with these perfect women. So we're, we're in Barbie land, all right? And who knows if we'll get to Oppenheimer, but let's at least try and do Barbie, okay? Maybe we'll do Oppenheimer next week, okay? We'll, maybe we'll, we'll have that marriage happen maybe next week, but let's go deep into Barbie right now. So Barbie opens, and, and friends, you gotta see it this week if you haven't seen it, because this is this cultural document. So Barbie opens, we're in the world of Barbie. So in this Barbie movie, there are two worlds. There's the Barbie world and the real world. Now. Listen to this. This is shamanic and interesting. So there's this very subtle connection between the real world and the Barbie world that takes place when a girl plays with her doll. So if a girl plays with her doll in an ordinary way, in an ordinary way, the two worlds remain separate. But there are certain moments where the girl who's playing with the doll can get in a certain kind of mood where that mood somehow enters the doll and then enters the doll world, okay? So the worlds are supposed to be separate, but every once in a while, some travesty, some disaster, some catastrophe happens and the worlds mix. That's what's gonna happen in this movie. That's one, point one. Now point two, okay? So the movie opens with the Barbie world and all the women look perfect. And the star of the movie is named Barbie and she's called the, what is she called? Whoever saw it, she's called the typical Barbie doll. But am I, it's the word typical. Is that the word? I'm going to the chat box. Who saw the movie? What was it called? I'm taking a look in the movie. Okay, all the women looking perfect, right? So here we go. We're going into Barbie land here. So she's called, right, the typical Barbie. But she's the typical Barbie. Everybody, she's the typical Barbie. And all of her friends are perfect with perfect makeup and perfect hair and perfect bodies, right? And, but they're in a women's world. This is really important. They're in a women's world. And they say, all the girls in the world are really supportive of Barbie because Barbie has allowed them to be doctors and lawyers and Nobel Prize winners because Barbie begins as just a classical level one woman. Everyone's with me? Barbie begins, she's first made as a level one woman, classical woman, level one. Right, she seduces her man, she looks beautiful. That's how Barbie begins. But then the Mattel toy company up levels Barbie, then Barbie begins to become all sorts of things. She becomes a doctor and a lawyer and a Nobel Prize prize winner. And so Barbie is really, we're in Barbie land and all the Barbies are really proud of themselves because they're empowering. They say, we're empowering women all over the world. We're showing them how to be doctors and lawyers and Nobel Prize winners. That's Barbie. Now stay close. Now, who's the girl, Barbie? Who's the guy, Ken? Ken has these perfectly ripped abs, ABS abs, just like me. No, I'm just kidding. That's not true. Okay. Right. <laughs> In my dreams. Okay. So, so Barbie has the, right. Ken's got these perfectly ripped bodies, like gorgeous. And his shirt's always, of course, wide open. Right. And Ken, when we first meet Ken, the narrator says, Ken only feels good if he, if he's in Barbie's gaze, if Barbie looks at him. What does Ken do? Ken has no job. Very interesting. Ken, so Barbie herself has moved, everyone get this? She's moved from level one to level two. Does everyone get that? That's what the movie says. Barbie, the movie doesn't say level one and level two. The movie just says Barbie begins as a classical, they don't use these words, but a classical 1950s girl, 
And then Barbie moves to level two where she's powerful. And we see like eight scenes of like Barbie being awarded a diploma, Barbie graduating from graduate school, Barbie becoming a doctor, Barbie being you know, a law professor, right? So Barbie's gone to level two. What about Ken? Remember Barbie and Ken? So Ken has got no job. Ken's not a lifeguard. Ken's not a lawyer. Ken's not a doctor. What does Ken do? Ken beaches. The word beach, beach is a verb. Ken beaches, that's what he knows how to do. Ken beaches, that's what Ken does. Now it looks cute in the movie, but actually when you begin to listen carefully, it's actually pathetic and tragic. It's Ken has no job, Ken has no job. And so Barbie will look at Ken and she'll smile at Ken. There's lots of Kens on the beach and Barbie smiles at them and looks at them. And when Barbie looks at them, they feel great. But then Barbie goes back and Ken says, can I come to your house tonight? And Barbie says, sure, because we're having a big girls party. Ken comes to the house and Ken dances that all the different Kens, the men dance with the women and then the women throw them out, right? And Barbie says, it's girls night tonight and it's girls night every night forever. You get that? It's girls night every night forever, meaning we don't need Ken, right? And then Ken kind of leans in wanting some right? Some, some kind of, right? He's, he's, he's reaching for some sexuality and Barbie's like, who are you? There's clear sexuality. He doesn't, he doesn't even know what sexuality is. And we're going to find out later when Barbie and Ken actually go to the real world and they have this conversation with the construction crew. Barbie says to the construction crew, he says, oh, me and Ken, we're very beautiful and we're very perfect, but we have no genitals, right? Meaning, you get that? We have no genitals, right? Because the Barbie doll, no genitals, right? Right. And what's the point, right? The point is there's no sexuality happening. You get that? There's no, there's no, there's no eros there. But we're at this level two place in which men don't have a role, right? Women are doing girls night forever, but the polarity has gotten completely lost. Does everyone get this so far? Right. It's fascinating. Now stay close. It gets even more interesting. So there's no universal love story at level two Barbie. And this is where culture is. This is the story that culture is telling, right? There's no sense of polarity that there needs to be a man, woman story. When I say man, woman, man, man, woman, woman, let's take all the LGBT thing for granted. Although the Barbie movie interestingly skipped it. The Barbie movie didn't do the LGBT thing. The Barbie movie just did man, woman, which was kind of, was the bravest thing the whole movie did, right? But basically the movie stops at level two. It's like, right? There's no room for Ken and Barbie. They don't have genitals. Now what happens? Now it gets completely wild. Are you guys ready for wild now? This is like, we're gonna do deep cultural analysis and it's gorgeous. So Barbie's at the party. She's at the party. And I just saw this last night. Okay, so I've got no notes on this. We're just doing this together live, okay? So. Barbie's at the party. And then in the middle of this incredible dance number at the party, she says, you know, and I've been thinking about death. The music stops. I think about death. Like everyone stops. I've been thinking about dying. Like everyone stops like, oh my, oh my God, you're thinking about dying. Like it ruins the whole thing. And then there's like this uncomfortable silence. And she meant, and I'm dying to dance. And everyone kind of breathes a sigh of relief. And it's like, it's okay. So we're dying to dance. The dancing goes on, right? So there's this weird thing where Barbie something, there's this malfunction. She's thinking about death and she can't understand why. She's like, what's going on? She can't understand why. And then, and then Barbie, she wakes up in the morning. She's thinking about death again. Her breath isn't good in the morning, which remember, but this is the perfect stereo. She's called the stereotypical Barbie. That's what she's called. The stereotypical Barbie. The stereotypical Barbie is always perfect. Her hair is always perfect. She always looks great. She's always perfectly calm and perfectly fantastic. She wakes up in the morning. Her, her breath is bad. She's thinking about death again. And her feet are flat, meaning they don't go into high heels while her feet are flat. She goes to the beach and she's, oh my God, my feet are flat. It's like, oh my God, what happened? My feet are flat. This is terrible, right? So the Barbie dolls tell her, if you have flat feet, you've got to go to weird Barbie. 
weird Barbie. And there's this one weird doll that got discontinued, right? You got to go to weird Barbie and talk to weird Barbie. So she knocks on the door of weird Barbie and, and weird Barbie says, oh my God, you've got flat feet. And then she picks up her skirt and she says, look, you have cellulite, right? Cellulite, right? I mean, right? You've got your, your legs aren't exactly perfect. You've got cellulite. She says, oh my God, that's terrible. What am I going to do, right? And she says, the only thing you can do to save yourself is there must have been some connection made between you and someone in the real world. That's what's going wrong. You've got to go there and break that connection. And if you break that connection, then your flat feet will be gone. Your cell light will be gone. She doesn't want to go to the real world, but she has no choice. So she gets in her little Barbie car. And she starts moving towards the real world. Okay. It's like wild. It starts moving, moving, moving towards the real world. And as she starts, and you got to take a car and a boat and a plane and a submarine and a helicopter. Right. So it's this long trip, cartoon trip. But as she starts the trip, she sees in the back seat, Ken, Ken's come with her. Because Ken, now guys, stay close. Ken loves her. You get this, friends? Ken's got no job. But Ken loves her, and Ken, Ken doesn't even feel like a man if he's not in Barbie's gaze, but he can't say that. Does everyone get that? He can't say that. Can't be done. He can't say it, right? So, so they begin to move to the world of real people. Now, they get to the world of real people, and they look, so that they get to Santa Monica, right, in Los Angeles, right? Venice Beach and Santa Monica in Los Angeles. And they're wearing these Barbie clothes. Ken's wearing his Ken Barbie outfit. And Barbie's wearing their Barbie clothes. And there's all these cool LA people. And they look at them like, you guys are crazy. You guys are completely crazy. So they kind of change their clothes. And then they realize this is weird. No one's thanking them for, for being Barbie and Ken. People are looking at them like they're weird and they're crazy. And they're, they're a little devastated. And so then there's this construction crew I told you about. They start whistling at Barbie and making fun of him. And she goes over and says, why are you guys whistling? I don't understand. I'm sensing a little violence in that whistle. And do you know how we are? We're built like this. We're always perfect. We have no genitals. And the construction kind of looks at them like, who are you? You're crazy. Right? And, and then Ken, now stay with me for a second. So they each go on their different journey. Right? They each go on an entirely different journey. And in this journey... Right? In this journey, there's this desire. I'm not going to take you on the whole journey. We're actually going to do one special day at Mystery School. We're going to do this whole journey. And anyone who's on one mountain now, anyone who's on one mountain now, it's our gift. You have a pass to that day, those three hours, where we're going to, we're going to complete this journey. Okay? So anyone who's on one mountain now, we'll take down everyone's email. Okay? And we'll send everyone who's on one mountain now right? right. Just if you're not already signed up, we'll send you just a gift for that three hours because we're actually going to, we're going to go deep into this story. It's a wild story, but I want to, I want to jump to the end a little bit now. So what happens? So in the end, Barbie has to move beyond being Barbie, but she doesn't quite get there. Barbie's got to realize, oh, poor Ken, poor Ken, he doesn't have a job. He just, he's just depends on me. And she says to Ken, Ken, you've got to be willing to be Ken just as Ken, which is great. But it's very clear that Barbie doesn't need Ken. So Ken embraces himself as being Ken, but he doesn't know what that means. He says, oh, I'm Ken. But Ken remains pathetic. He doesn't have a sense of what it means to be a man. And Barbie, at the very last scene of the movie, she decides to stay in real people's land. And the last thing that happens in the movie is she goes into an office and she said, oh, this is my gynecologist, right? Woman's doctor, meaning she's getting a vagina. So the movie ends with Barbie reclaiming her sexuality, Ken not reclaiming his, Ken doesn't know his masculinity, so what Barbie does at the end of the movie is she actually reclaims her ability to be sexual, but not with any particular Ken. 
that's how the movie ends. Now, the journey in between is fascinating. I mean, it's one of the most fascinating journeys you can imagine, but it doesn't get home. It doesn't get to a place where Ken and Barbie have any real reason to come back together. In other words, we don't get to level three. We actually get to exactly where culture is today, in which Ken realizes I have to have an, you know, Ken says, I've got to have an identity as Ken and be not dependent on Barbie. But Ken says, I want to do patriarchy. Ken goes to the real world and they tell him about patriarchy. He says, this is really cool. I like patriarchy. But he says, but, but I don't, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a professor. I'm not a Nobel Prize winner. So patriarchy doesn't work for me so well. So remember this, so it's, it's talking about the men who are in the manufacturing class. So he said, but I'm going to do patriarchy even without a job. Does everyone get this? This is really deep. So, so Ken decides in the movie, I'm going to do patriarchy, but without having a powerful job, just because I'm a man. Wow. Does everyone get how pathetic that is and how tragic that is? And it's Ken's desperate to do patriarchy. I'm going to, I want to, I'm in charge. Ken's are in charge but I don't have a job I, I, and I don't actually have, I haven't run a successful business. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a successful accountant. I'm just doing patriarchy just because I'm Ken. And my friends, I want you to get the pathos of that and the tragedy of that because that Barbie scene, none of the reviewers have actually caught the tragedy of this. That is where right, the majority of men are more than 50% in the world today. We want patriarchy to be going on, right? But we actually haven't done the achievements of patriarchy even, right? We're not even in the achievement class of the, that 10%. We just want there to be patriarchy just because I'm a man. And, and I'm just going to embrace my Kenness. Problem is that doesn't work, right? Because who am I? Because I actually don't have a unique self. And I'm not homo amor. Right, and I, and I don't have a new vision of relationship. So there's no new vision of desire here. I just want you to get this. There's no new narrative of desire. There's no new vision of relationship, what we call roommate to soulmate to whole mate, right? Which I'm not gonna talk about here. If you're new, you don't even know what that means, but roommate to soulmate to whole mate's this new level of relationship doesn't exist, literally doesn't exist. There's no narrative of desire. There's no sense of what should I be if I can't be lawyer, doctor, powerful person, what should I do? We have no idea. That's number one. Barbie sees no reason to have a man. So Barbie doesn't, she says, oh, Ken, Ken, like, oh, Ken, you know, I, I'm so sorry that we had girls night all the time. We don't have girls night all the time. Yo, you can have boys sometimes. Then he moves to kiss her and she says, yo, go away. All right, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. But, but, but she goes to the real world and she goes to a gynecologist to get a vagina. Meaning, I don't need men for sex. I can do sex. I'm going to get my vagina. Right, but but why would I need a man for that? Or certainly not a permanent man. And 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 Ken has this incredible line in the movie. He says to Barbie at the most poignant moment, he says, I always thought this would be our house together. Right. And then there's a key moment in the movie, earlier in the movie, and we're going to talk about this at, at mystery school, where the men, right, basically they make themselves the men in charge, and all the Barbies, the Nobel Prize women. And the doctors and lawyers say, fuck the Nobel Prize. Oh, sorry, Ariana, apologize, right? They say, forget about the Nobel Prize. We just want to serve the man because we were so lonely having our Nobel Prize and being lawyers and doctors. They say, forget that. We'll just serve the men. So all these accomplished women just go to serve the men. And then there's this key figure in the movie who wakes the women up from that terrible idea. So do you get what happens? The women at level two get lonely. Does everyone get this? The women at level two in the movie get lonely. And they can't figure out how to get back in a relationship with a man. So they go back to level one. Does everyone get that? Who got that? So they go back to level one, but then they realize it doesn't work. They each get woken up. What do they get woken up to? Back into level two, right? Without any level three, without any new vision of feminine desire. In other words, in the entire Barbie movie, here's the crazy thing. There's not one drop of feminine empowerment. This is supposed to be the great feminine empowerment movie. There's zero empowerment. It's empowerment of women to have sex like a man, meaning I just have my vagina, but I don't need men, but right? I can have sex however and whenever I want. 
There's no need for there to be the universal love story. There's no need for there to be relationship. I'm going to go back to being doctor, lawyer, Nobel Prize winner. I'm going to go back to the real world. I'm going to embrace my humanity and my death. But why would I be in relationship? That's actually exactly where it gets to. It does not get beyond that because that's where culture got. And this movie is, is talked, this movie is talked, it's supposed to be the great movie of feminine empowerment. There's not one second of feminine empowerment in this movie because feminine empowerment means you're empowered as a woman. To be empowered as a woman means, yes, I can be a doctor for sure. I can be a lawyer because men and women can both be doctors and lawyers. But I also want to be a lawyer, right? In a way that's not the way a man's a lawyer, right? I, I want to be just as good a lawyer, but I want to bring my feminine. What's my feminine? What does it mean to be a woman? Why is it that there actually are anatomical differences between men and women? There are hormonal differences between men and women. There's obviously body differences between men and women. I mean, the world did produce masculine and feminine. So I don't want to be a lawyer, a doctor, Nobel Prize winner and give up my feminine. I want to integrate my feminine. So there's no feminine empowerment and there's no masculine empowerment. And what does it mean to be a man when I'm trying, and it's pathetic. The men are trying to do patriarchy without a job. I mean, do you get how pathetic that image is? I mean, it's an, and basically it mocks men. There's not one good male hero in the movie. It's filled with women's heroes, which is why it's, it's why people say this is feminine empowerment. So the heroes are all women, that's true but there's no vision of feminine empowerment. Does everyone understand what that, I mean by that sentence? I mean, you've got women heroes, but they're not being feminine. They've just become men, right? But there's no integration. There's no new narrative of what it means to be the new woman. Who's the level three woman? So there's no level three woman and there's no level three man. The difference is, is that women still come out heroes. You get this? That in the movie, the women still are the heroes and the men, are actually tragic and pathetic. There's not one image of a man in the movie. There's a, you, we get to the Mattel boardroom in the movie, right? And because she, in the real, in the real, in the movie, she goes to the real world and she goes to the Mattel, you know, big office building and they get to the, the office where all the board members, all the men, and it mocks all of the men. It's a terrible vision of men. These are the patriarchy guys and they're shallow and they're superficial and they're idiots, right? And there's this key woman in the movie, a woman and her daughter. They're the heroes, right? But, but, and then we meet, we meet their husband at the end of the movie. He's an idiot, right? So, so here's, here's what we got. I want you to get where the movie goes. And we're going to do like, you know, one more hour on this, something like that at the mystery school. And we'll decide what day, Krista, and we'll, you know, in Shahati, and we'll send everyone a note, okay? If you want to come for the part two. But, I want, but we, we got part one already because it's such a big deal. So this is the major blockbuster hit, right? It takes us to level two men and women. And at level two, the woman is the hero, right? She's succeeded in being a man, but she hasn't embraced any new dimension of the feminine, even sexuality, she does like a man, right? There's no new experience of feminine desire of feminine power. There's just feminine power being like a man. There's no vision of the masculine at all. There's no masculine heroes in the entire movie, which is exactly where we are in culture, right? Where the feminine is almost identified with the good, right? The feminine is identified with the good. The feminine has no shadow, right? She doesn't need a man. And the masculine is pathetic. He's trying to be patriarchy without a job, essentially, right? With this incredibly pathetic view of a man. And, and the one big action scene of men is men fighting with each other, where the women get the men to fight with each other, right? Because they can't get women, so they fight with each other. And there's this huge, hilarious battle scene between the men, where they're fighting with tennis rackets and you know this insane choreographed, very funny and very tragic and pathetic scene. So here's what I, I wanna invite friends, okay? I wanna invite everyone to see the movie, okay? I wouldn't come to the second one without seeing the movie. See the movie, and it's gonna make such perfect sense. And then we'll go to the next level. And what we're also going to do at Mystery School, so if it, I mean, the best thing to do would be sign up, right? So, you know, if basically you feel like, wow, I don't have, I don't have money to cover food this month, which I completely understand, because I've been like that when I was in college, right? So no problem. This is our gift. But if you got money to cover food, sign up for the live stream, 
Okay. Sign up, just do the live stream with us. Even if you don't, even if you don't do it, you know, all week, you'll just have the live stream. And Chris, I don't even know what the live stream is probably, you know, 20, 30, 40 bucks. I don't know what it is, whatever it is, right? It's cheap, right? If someone can't afford it, just tell me my gift. I'll pay for it personally. Anyone who can't afford the live stream, you send me your email, my gift, I'll pay for it personally. It's not a lot. It's a very little, okay? So sign up for the live stream, be with us in the live stream. And we're going to hit like a deeper view, but, but really see Barbie, okay? See Barbie and see Oppenheimer. And one more thing, just to be a little crazy, who wants to be crazy here? Let's be crazy. We're doing the revolution. It's summer. We got to be a little crazy in the summer. The other movie we're going to cover, right, in the mystery school is Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay. So, so if I can give everybody, you know, and again, you can say like, Gaffney, give us an assignment, but why would we do it? So no one needs to do anything, but if you want to, right, and you would have like a great week, see Barbie and Oppenheimer, but then see the three episodes of Guardians of the Galaxy, one, two, three. So the mystery school doesn't start till next Monday. So you got like nine days. We're not going to start the movies till probably Tuesday, Wednesday. So you got like 10 days to see five movies. That's not bad. Now, this is very, very important though. If you see the movie, popcorn, no dieting. Need popcorn, you don't need butter, but you totally need popcorn. You can't see a movie without popcorn. So blank the diet, forget about that. Get like a Diet Coke. I know it has aspartame, but just do it once, okay? Just one, Diet Coke, popcorn for each movie. Sit back, right? Get a couple of friends. If you're living by yourself, you can see it together. Watch it with someone on Zoom, right? Kick back and have five movie nights. Now, what you might want to do if you want to get really crazy about it. So I'm a little crazy. That's just, I apologize for that. But so I have this little thing on my, um, on my, here we go. On my, um, you know, that, that program on the computer, what's it called? What is it called? Here it is. You know, this program that's called, can you see it? Notes, this little notes program on the computer. So on my notes program, I have, how many notes do I have? I have 285 notes, okay? And my notes are whenever I'm kind of watching a movie or I'm like, I'm like I can be like walking down the street. I'll just take notes on what's around me, right? Just all the time. I'll just take like notes. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's, oh, there's a mother and child. But look at that interaction. Here's a psychological principle. So I'm, I'm crazy. So I've got, I've got, as I was watching with my little son, I was watching Oppenheimer. And then on Barbie, I was kind of, I took like notes, like the whole movie. I just all through the movie. And of course, everyone in the theater got upset with me. Turn that phone off. So I had to go to the back of the theater not to light up the movie theater. So if you want to, right? But there's no, you have to have popcorn. You have to have something to drink. But if you want to also take notes. As you watch Oppenheimer, right? And as you watch, right? As you watch Barbie, take notes. Now, you guys have time for two more minutes? Who's got just two more minutes, okay? Two more minutes, just show of hands. Is that okay? Just, I promise, really just two more minutes because I did promise Oppenheimer and Barbie. So I'm not going to go into Oppenheimer now. I'm just going to say one thing. Just This is just a tease. This is a tease. Who is the goddess in the Oppenheimer movie? Now it's who is she? Who's the goddess? There's a central figure who's the goddess in the Oppenheimer movie. And I'm going to already tell you who she is. And that's going to help you. I'm not going to say anything about it. The goddess is Jean Tatlock, who's the communist woman that he has an affair with. It's the only nude scene happens twice in the movie. And it's actually one, it's a new way of doing a nude scene in a movie. It's actually done really elegantly and beautifully, right? But she's the goddess. And in the movie, the goddess commits suicide. So I want you to get this. You have to watch the movie knowing that she's the goddess. Jean Tatlock, who's a woman who was a communist, right? In the, in the 40s, right, who was very close to Oppenheimer, he had a, he wanted to marry her, she didn't want to, right, and so they kind of break up, he gets married, but he remains with her, and after, even after he started the atomic energy project at Los Alamos, she calls him, and he goes to be with her for a night, then he refuses to see her again, and she commits suicide, a very complex story, but it's very important, she's the goddess both in her beauty, and she's also the dark goddess, now stay close, friends, because in every tradition, you have what's called the dark goddess. So Kali, right? In Kashmir Shaivism and Hinduism is both light and dark. She's complicated, right? The Shekhinah in Hebrew wisdom is both the Aim Nora'ah, the terrible goddess, and the beautiful goddess. So she is Lilith, 
she's Lilith. She's a Lilith goddess. She's a very beautiful, Lilith is a complex figure, right? Which our beloved Jacqueline has studied deeply, right? So Lilith is this, this complex, deeply alive, deeply erotic, deeply intelligent, deeply sexual goddess. And the man can't quite hold her. And actually, stay close with me, Jean Tatlock gets Oppenheimer in an enormous amount of trouble. In other words, he loses in the end his security clearance in 1949 because an attempt to take him down after the atomic bomb in 1945 uses the Jean Tatlock story and her suicide and his visit to her. But you actually can't understand the movie and not one review, just not one review of Barbie gets even vaguely close. I looked at last night at 2 a.m., but like 20 reviews of Barbie and 20 reviews of Oppenheimer and they are tragically the superficiality of culture. They're just jokes. And I, I apologize for being so harsh, but they're, they're so superficial and so pathetic and so tragic. Now, when I say these are the right readings of, of Oppenheimer and, and Barbie, which I am saying, I'm not saying that that was the conscious intention of the filmmakers, right? A movie becomes a text of public culture, which is a goddess text. This is Eros speaking. Doesn't matter what the filmmakers were, were, were thinking, right? And it's, there's a there's a power to the movie, right, which is way beyond the conscious intention of the filmmakers. And I've shared with some of you before when I spend a night um, with Lana Wachowski, she made The Matrix, and then she made a movie called V for Vendetta. So I spent a night with Lana and his partner, and her partner, excuse me, Karen, right, in Chicago, and we were reading you know, the V for Vendetta and the Matrix movie. And I said to Lana, I don't care what you think about the movie. And the fact that you made it is very nice, but that doesn't give you more authority than me. <laughs> In other words, the fact that you made the movie doesn't mean you're right about what it means. It just means you know what your intention is. You don't know what the movie's saying. You can't make that claim. And, it, and she said, that's absolutely true. She completely got that. I mean, and, and actually both Barbie and Oppenheimer are actually great movies. Oppenheimer particularly, but Barbie's a great movie and it's tragedy and it's reaching for something. There's this desperation in it and it comes out completely empty, but it captures unintentionally, does everyone get that? Unintentionally precisely what culture is. And in order for us to become homo amor, we need to begin to learn how to read the texts of culture. How do we read these texts, right? Because these are actually sacred texts of culture unintentional sacred texts. And so we need to know how to read them. So again, summation, here's the summation. One, popcorn, Diet Coke, A. B, Barbie and Oppenheimer. That's B and C. D, if you can, C, all three Guardians of the Galaxy. The Guardians of the Galaxy are incredibly important movies. And my friend, Aubrey Marcus, we're about to start a movie channel at some point. And Aubrey challenged him and he said, what can you say about, um, about Guardians of the Galaxy? So I, do, I did, a, you know, an Aubrey's invitation, I did a deep dive into Guardians of the Galaxy for like three nights all night. And I watched them and wrote to myself maybe 60, 70 pages analyzing the scenes in Guardians of the Galaxy. Right? Now, why did I know that it would work? I knew it would work for a simple reason. Guardians of the Galaxy swept a certain part of culture. It kind of swept... 30 year olds, 30 to fit, like I would say, not even that, I'd say 20 to 50 to 55, something like that. The kind of senior bo boomers didn't get it. They're like, what's the stupid movie? Like, what's Guardians of the Galaxy? But like Aubrey's whole crowd loved it, right? My friend Aaron, who's a, who's a football guy, Aaron kind of like, oh my God, he loved it, right? So this whole world loved Guardians of the Galaxy. So I knew if everyone loved it, there must be something happening there that's real. And it turns out that it's fascinating, but of course, none of the reviews get it. You got to go deeper. And, and when I say, I, I want to get, I want to be, I, I feel bad for a second. Hold it. When, when I say none of the reviews get it, I don't mean that in an arrogant way. It's just true. So you be the judge after we did Guardian, you be the judge whether we got it at a whole different level or not. It's not because we're smart. It's not about being smart. That's not the point. The point is you've got to feel into the inside You've got to treat every dialogue with respect and notice that it's not the intention of the filmmaker. It's what 
actually happens. And Guardians of the Galaxy, I'm just going to give you one hint. It completely changes our relationship to trauma. It changes our relationship to unique self. Changes our relationship to, to love, to eros. Everything changes. It's unbelievably important. Okay, it's, it's, so it's this silly movie, which has the ra a raccoon as one of its stars, right? So I'm gonna be clear, Rocket the Raccoon, Ujus is one of the stars, and Rocket the Raccoon turns out to be very serious. Now here's one more thing, last thing and then we're done. If you really wanna do it seriously, if you wanna really challenge yourself to read cultures, this sounds like it's easy, we're doing movies. It actually takes enormous energy and commitment to do anything well. So if you do Guardians of the Galaxy, you gotta watch all three, number one, and then here's the key, trace the development of the characters through the three movies. Does everyone get that? Who's Rocket in movie one? Who's Rocket in movie two? How many people here have seen Guardians of the Galaxy? Anybody here? A bunch, there's a bunch of people here. Okay, good. So you gotta trace Rocket in movie one, Drax the Destroyer in movie one, right? Gamora, Thanos' daughter in movie one. And you gotta trace all the figures through all the movies. Does that make sense? Got to trace all the figures through all the movies. And then there's a new figure. Um, what's his name? Um, Adam, who comes in at the end of movie two. Who remembers Adam at the end of movie two? Simone, I see, does. It becomes central. So you got to trace the figures carefully, right? And if you can read these texts, you can actually become home all more. And it's knowing how to read these texts, beginning to develop the eyes of love that can actually look at culture and understand the play. And then we can move to transform culture because everything happening in Guardians is happening in me, right? That's the thing. It's all happening in me. And if I can't read it in Guardians, I can't read it in me. I can go to a therapist from today till tomorrow. Believe me, the therapists are the people who are reading Barbie exactly at that level two way, right? It's a therapeutic culture that created Barbie. It's tragic. Right? It's tragic. And I could point to at least 10 people on the screen now that I know well, that I've done Holy of Holies with, that I know something about their lives. And I could say, wow, Barbie, that's your life. This piece in Oppenheimer, that's your life. It's a big deal. So being able to read Barbie is not a cute assignment. It's actually a deep Vipassana practice and actually being able to read the text of culture. So, so friends, you got to look at this very, very carefully, okay? Barbara Marks Hubbard and I love to talk about movies. And in Our Holy of Holies, I would do movies with Barbara. I'd actually go over a movie and analyze a movie. So these are really, really crazily important texts of culture. Oh my God, love mad friends. Homo amor to homo amor, right? And the revolution's gotta be like super serious, but also we gotta laugh. We gotta celebrate along the way. So don't forget the popcorn, right? Mad love from here in Bretton Woods. And maybe the last sentence is, you know, Bretton Woods was to create a new world order that failed. And it lasted until maybe 1972 when Nixon unhooked the dollar from certain standards, right? And the whole Pax Americana that kept the world together for 40, 50 years is falling apart. So we actually need to, to create a new world order, right? In other words, the new world order after World War II has actually collapsed. The Bretton Woods order has collapsed. So here we are in Bretton Woods again, right? And we're here to create a new world order. We're here to create a new world. We're here to create a new human and a new humanity. So we've come back to Bretton Woods, right? We've come back to Bretton Woods to get it right. Mad love, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. What a crazy, crazy delight to be with you. Cha, cha.